Well, please open your Bible to the book of 1 Peter and turn to chapter 3, if you would. The Lord has been so kind to not only bring us into our salvation, but also to see us through it, sustains us and preserves us in our salvation. While there are inevitably times in the believer's life when they experience trials and hardships, persecutions, and their faith is even tested, the Lord has given us examples and truths that are so stabilizing and so steadying in the midst of the challenges we face. We've been seeing that in 1 Peter chapter 3. We've been working our way through this section of 1 Peter the last couple of weeks, and we've been seeing Peter masterfully put forth these truths of the greatness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These truths have a stabilizing effect on the believer in the midst of persecution and hardship, and we've been seeing the faithfulness of God in the midst of affliction and how when the the culture comes against us and when the world comes against us and persecution arises and even when there are spiritual attacks that we experience, demonic influence, God is Lord over all of it and actually uses what the enemy would want to do to oppose us as a means of bringing us through, affirming our faith, refining our faith, and even allowing us to be used as a spiritual impact on others unto faith in Jesus. Let's read our passage together, verses 18 through 22. Peter says this, starting in verse 18, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. Having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison who once were disobedient when the patience of the Lord kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. We've been looking at how Peter presents five expressions of Jesus' supremacy that stabilize the believer in their suffering. Five expressions of Jesus' supremacy that stabilize believers in their suffering. In the midst of suffering for Christ, suffering for righteousness, as we've seen these early believers, they must understand God's trustworthiness in all of it, particularly through his son, Jesus. And Peter points them, points us, to truths about Jesus that have an amazing stabilizing effect on the Christian in the midst of persecution for the sake of Christ. By way of review, two weeks ago, we saw the first expression in that Jesus is Lord over salvation. He is Lord of salvation, Lord over salvation. We saw that in verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. And Peter is drawing the line between Christ's suffering, and God's divine purpose in it for our ultimate good so that we will have an unwavering confidence that even in our suffering, God still has good purposes in it. And so he points to Christ's death and what was accomplished through it. Jesus died making payment for the specific sins of all who would believe for all time. A once-for-all sacrifice, as we saw. The just one died for the unjust ones. It's truly amazing. So Jesus is Lord over salvation. He did all of this to bring us to God. He solved our greatest problem, which was our sin before a holy God. And he has brought us to God. We've been brought to God. And so Jesus, being Lord over salvation, gives us confidence that he has brought us to God. And he will then also bring us through our suffering to the fullness of our salvation. We can have confidence in this. 
God has brought you safely to himself through Jesus, and so you can trust him that he will bring you safely through your affliction. And then last week, we looked at the fact that Jesus is also Lord over death. This was the next expression of Jesus' supremacy, that Jesus is Lord over death. We saw this at the end of verse 18, where Peter says, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And Peter, continuing with the reality that for the believer, they have been brought to God, he now draws attention to the end of verse 18, that Jesus was put to death in the flesh, meaning he died as a human on behalf of humans, In order for his death to be in the place of man, even as we talked about again this evening, Jesus had to die as a man, yet he was made alive in the spirit. Peter's point here is he was raised unto eternal resurrection power, eternal resurrected life. Jesus died as a man, being the substitute for sin, and was raised to life as a glorified, resurrected Savior, never to die again, and that is the life that he gives to those he's brought to God. We saw how Peter's point is not that Jesus was made alive in the Holy Spirit, as some would say. It is true, we talked about this last week, that the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son all were involved in the power that raised Christ from the dead. But that's not Peter's point here. That doesn't make uh, an additional add to his point that he's making. Rather, to be raised in the Spirit is for Jesus to be raised as the eternal second person of the triune God unto resurrection and eternal life, resurrection power, which he gives to those whom he saves and The spirit here, this word, it simply means means your inner man, your inner being. And so Jesus, at the core of who he is, was raised unto resurrection, life, and power. This fits much better in the context and flow of Peter's discourse as he's going to highlight the resurrection again, as we'll see shortly at the end of verse 21. And the power that that has, the implications of his resurrection on the believer's life. And so Jesus is Lord over salvation, and Jesus is also Lord over death. He died a human death, paying the price to bring us to God, and he was raised in the Spirit unto resurrected life with power that is given to those who believe. And we don't now fear death ultimately. Why? Because Jesus conquered it. And in Jesus bringing us to God safely and conquering death, next we saw last week that Jesus is also in this Lord over Satan's schemes. Lord over Satan's schemes. Look at verses 19 and 20. Peter says, In which also he, that is Jesus, went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So in the days of Noah, we looked at this last week, there was a demonic scheme where there was an attempt to stop God's promise all the way back from Genesis 3 of a coming Messiah who would crush the serpent's head. Disobedient demons, they left their abode and attempted to create a worldwide culture so wicked with demonic possession that they would stop God's plan of salvation. God, in control the whole time, preserves Noah and his family in righteousness, and then preserves them through the judgment by means of the ark, and brings him and his family safely through the worldwide catastrophic judgment. The ark was a refuge or safety for Noah and his family, the eight who were brought through the judgment safely through God's divine protection. And we'll talk more about that in just a few moments. We looked last week at how 2 Peter 2, 4, and 5, and Jude verse 6 are particularly helpful in filling in some gaps that these early believers who received this letter would have been familiar with. They're helpful for us in understanding what took place. And what we see is that Jesus is not only Lord over salvation, he's not only Lord over death, conquering it, but he is the fulfillment of the promise of God. He has conquered death. He's the fulfillment of the promise of God to crush Satan's head from Genesis 3. And so he has made a way to bring us to God 
And in so doing, he's the one who has thwarted demonic schemes led by the devil to stop the salvation plan of God. In verse 19, Jesus went and made proclamation of his victory that the Messiah did come, that the line was not broken, that Jesus made a way to bring us to God. And he proclaimed that victory to those imprisoned demons of how he has brought sinners to God through his death and resurrection. So in light of that, this proclamation would have then had to have taken place after his resurrection. And now Jesus, verse 22, as we'll also look at in a few moments, is at the right hand of God, having all authority over angels, authorities, and powers. Jesus has accomplished ultimate victory. He's the Lord over salvation. He's the Lord over death. He's the Lord over Satan's schemes. He is Lord of all. Lord over Satan's attempts to keep sinners from having a way of salvation. At every point, Satan's plans were thwarted. They were stopped. And again, why is Peter writing this? Why is he informing his readers? What are the implications of these truths for us? Well, listen, when evil rises up against you because of your association with Christ because of your faithfulness to God, and you're tempted to shrink back, to not stand firm in the true grace of God, right? That's why Peter says he's writing this letter in chapter 5. When you're tempted to shrink back, maybe even doubt God's faithfulness and doubt God's goodness in the midst of your affliction, Peter is showing us, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. He was righteous in every way. He suffered at the hands of sinful men to accomplish God's great plan to redeem and save you, bringing you to God. And not only did God work despite evil attacks against God, against his plans, but God actually uses those evil attacks deliberately for his own purposes. We saw this in Genesis 50. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And it's just staggering. It's so captivating the wisdom and power of God in his care for his people and his care for his own glory to keep his promises. So when you experience unjust suffering from sinful men, you can trust Jesus is Lord over your salvation. He is Lord over death. He has conquered death to bring you to God if you are in Christ. He has thwarted the most egregious, wicked, evil schemes against his plans and purposes to try to keep him from being faithful to his promises, and you are stabilized by that. Because whatever evil is rising up against you as you walk in righteousness, you can have confidence that without a shadow of a doubt, God is Lord over your circumstances. And he will be faithful. Now that was review. For this evening, number four, Jesus is also Lord over believers. He is Lord over believers. In verse 18, we saw that Jesus is Lord over salvation. He made a way to bring us to God. Well, here in verse 21, Peter's going to bring clarity to what he shared in verse 20 and speak to what God has done as the Lord over the believer's life. And this salvation that he gives in verse 18, we see the impact of that on the believer in verse 21. So these are very closely related. The first Reality that the Lord is Lord over, that Jesus is Lord over salvation is very closely tied to this reality that Jesus is also Lord over the believer's life. Peter starts verse 21 with the phrase corresponding to that. Do you see that there at the beginning of verse 21? Corresponding to that. The the term corresponding to is used to communicate that something is a picture of something else or a representation of something. You may have heard the term a type. And this is a type. One reality or person or circumstance is a picture or representation of something that has come after. And here Peter is saying that what he described in verse 20 regarding Noah is a representation of, it corresponds to, it's corresponding to this, it's a picture of what he's communicating in verse 21. And so let's ensure that we understand what Peter just spoke about in verse 20. We're going to spend a little bit more time back in verse 20. 
Look at what Peter says. He says, who once were disobedient. That's those disobedient uh, spirits, those evil spirits who once were disobedient. And then he says, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So those disobedient spirits who were trying to create a global wicked culture, most likely attempting global demon possession, they were seeking to accomplish evil in the evil hearts of men. So it's not like man was off the hook here. Man's heart was evil. If you remember Genesis 6-5, God's assessment, he says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What an indictment. This was only seven generations from Adam and Eve when this is God's assessment of man. Evil is reigning on the earth in the hearts of men. Demonic schemes are taking place against God. And God tells Noah, I'm going to destroy them. But you make an ark so that you and your family are preserved in the midst of my judgment and wrath that I will bring upon the earth. So Noah found favor with God. He was a righteous man. In fact, in 2 Peter 2.5, it says that he was a herald of righteousness. That means he was a preacher. He proclaimed righteousness against the unrighteousness of his day. And the wickedness that was taking place, it was so severe, it was unconscionable, it was horrible, it was egregious, it was completely debased and evil. And look what Peter says in verse 20. At that time of complete moral wickedness that would provoke the Lord to bring worldwide catastrophic flood, killing all in judgment, he says, the patience of the Lord kept waiting. Now, this is a statement that we might have a tendency to blow past and miss, and we just can't do it. It is so profound here. God's patience is absolutely unparalleled. Unparalleled. Man is in a state where every thought and intention of the heart is only evil continually, and God withholds his judgment in patience as he is providing shelter from the judgment for Noah and his family. Noah is building the ark, and God is patient and keeps waiting. And he patiently lets evil keep going as he accomplishes redemptive purposes in his people. He is both supremely patient and completely righteous as his wrath and judgment are literally going to rain down on the earth. Destroying everyone, and yet he holds off this wrath while he is saving those he has set his heart to save. God patiently delays his righteous holy wrath while he is graciously redeeming. And listen, God is supremely just. He is supremely holy. He will not let one sin in all of eternity go unpunished. Every sin, thought, word, or deed, will be addressed by the holy, sovereign, righteous, good God. And it should be. That is right. And yet he is infinitely patient. He's patient. Noah and his family are given time to build the ark. God patiently delays his righteous, holy wrath while he is graciously redeeming. And so for us, when we suffer for righteousness, when we suffer for doing what is right, we can know that this is only because God is being patient while he is redeeming. Think about that. We can trust God. When we are sinned against, when unjust treatment comes our way, when we are persecuted for doing what is right, And it feels as though they're getting away with it. This is unjust. I want justice. Listen, God demands justice. And he will bring it to pass. And so whatever unjust deeds are taking place against his people, 
We don't have to wonder, will it be dealt with? We can actually find comfort. God is patiently enduring and waiting and holding back, and we can trust that in his patience, he is also redeeming and reconciling. What a comfort in the midst of persecution. What a comfort. So in the days of Noah, God waited patiently while Noah built the ark. He patiently delayed his imminent judgment while he's graciously redeeming. And then Peter says, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Noah and his family passed through the judgment water safely as they are in the ark, which is a deliverance for them from the judgment of God. And in the ark, they come through the judgment while being shielded and protected from the judgment. And you have to understand what God did here because of the picture it is for us of what Peter explains next. God could have provided deliverance for Noah and his family any way he wanted to. He could have taken them from the earth, brought judgment on the earth, and then put them back on the earth after, if he so willed. But God did not remove judgment from Noah and his family. Rather, what did God do? He brought them through the judgment. He brought them through the judgment in an ark of protection. And God carried out his judgment on sinful man through the flood. And Noah and his family were immersed in the judgment on sinful man through the flood. Noah and his family were immersed in the judgment, yet God showed them grace because he brought them safely through that judgment while protecting them in the ark. Listen, this was God's divine protection. Noah wasn't saved from the flood because of his own ingenuity. God told him to do it. God delayed his wrath. God made the provision. This was God's divine protection. God protected them from his judgment as they were in the ark, and so they went through the judgment, but they were rescued by God from his judgment inside of the ark. And that is what Peter is reminding us of in verse 20. Noah came through the flood safely, Noah and his family being delivered from God's judgment, and corresponding to that, or with that as a representation, he's now going to share with us and point us to spiritual realities relating to our salvation to help us understand God's care for us also in Christ. It's just so amazing, so compelling. He's going to show us how Jesus is Lord over the believer. Look at verse 21. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. And then he says, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. And then through the resurrection of Christ. And we'll come back to those middle phrases in a moment. But you could say, baptism now saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in the same way the eight were brought safely through God's judgment, through an ark of redemption, we are saved by baptism through the resurrection of Jesus. Now, baptism simply means to be immersed. That's why we baptize someone, or when we baptize someone, we dunk them. We don't sprinkle. We dunk them all the way under the water. We immerse them all the way under the water and bring them out. So as Noah and his family were inside the, inside the ark and brought through the judgment, the believer is immersed, is baptized, immersed into Christ as their shield of protection from judgment. The believer can pass through the judgment they deserve while being shielded from it because of Christ and his resurrection. The believer being immersed into Christ's death and resurrection may die a physical death. You and I all, if the Lord tarries, will die a physical death. And yet when facing judgment, we are protected from that judgment. In Christ, we are brought through the judgment safely because we have obtained, as the free gift, Christ's righteousness. And so we're brought through that judgment safely unto resurrected life because of Christ. 
He paid for our sins. He endured the judgment for us. He grants to us his righteousness and brings us safely through the judgment, immersed in him or covered and protected with his righteousness. Now, is Peter talking about the act of being baptized for clarity or a spiritual reality here? Well, it's, it's clear in this context, he's not talking about the waters of baptism. But immersion into Christ, he even clarifies that for us. We'll insert those phrases back into the middle that we pulled out for a moment. L- look again at verse 21. He says, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. This isn't an external baptism that is to be a representation of an internal reality. We know that the act of being baptized in water is simply an outward display of the inward reality that's already taken place. No one is saved before God because they go through the action of being baptized. Rather, it's a picture of what has saved you, of the spiritual reality that has taken place. And so Peter says, you're not being saved by removing what is on the outside, but it is an immersion into Christ that comes through an appeal to God for a good conscience. Turn to Romans 6 for just a moment. Turn to the left to Romans chapter 6. I want you to see this with me. It really helps us understand what Peter's describing here as Paul describes it also in really helpful detail. Romans chapter 6, look at verse 3. Paul says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized or immersed into Christ Jesus have been baptized or immersed into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life." Verse 5, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who died is freed from sin. You see how Paul puts forth there what we saw in verse 18 and what we see here in verse 21. All that Jesus has accomplished in dying for sins, the unjust for the just, so that we might be brought to God and that we've been immersed into Christ, a baptism that saves us. Not the removal of dirt from the exterior, but an appeal for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus. We have been crucified with Christ. We've been raised up with him now in newness of life. And so as the believer is immersed into Christ, the believer is united with Christ, our old life is done away with, our condemnation is removed, our sin is dealt with, it's paid for, and our guilt is removed. With this, we have a clean or a good conscience which is what he says we appeal to God for. We're covered with Christ's righteousness as we are immersed in him. Our sin was paid for at the cross, and now in his resurrection, we are united with Christ. So though we will die a physical death, it is not an eternal death, but we, like Noah, will pass through the judgment and yet be protected, really shielded, from the judgment because we're immersed in Christ who is for us an ark of protection from the judgment of God. That's the immersion that water baptism pictures. This doing away with the old, being united with Christ in his death and being united and raised up with Christ in his resurrection. So here, Peter is not talking about the act of water baptism, but he's speaking of the spiritual reality of being immersed into Christ, who is our safety and our protection from God's judgment. Listen, we can never have a good conscience apart from Christ. We needed something external for us to have a good conscience, for us to be freed of our guilt, for our sin to be dealt with. We couldn't rid ourselves of our guilt. We could never pay the blood price for our own sin. All that we could do is be punished for all eternity under God's just divine wrath. That's all we could do. 
We couldn't redeem ourselves. We needed an ark of redemption. And Peter says, Jesus is that for us. Now, for clarity, as believers, we are still called to keep a good conscience in our conduct before God. We're called to live holy lives. Be holy as I am holy. We'll see in the next chapter. But that's not what Peter is talking about here. He's not talking about keeping a good conscience as a believer under God's grace. He's talking about a freedom from guilt, a good conscience unto salvation that frees you from the guilt that you were once under. And so, while we were headed to judgment before as we were guilty before God, we can make an appeal to God for our deepest need, which is to have our guilt removed and to have a good conscience before God. And the only way that that can happen is when we are immersed or when we're baptized into Christ, who paid for our sin, he removed our guilt, he rose from the grave, he conquered death, and he grants to all who believe upon him resurrected life and power. This is the only way. You cannot obtain a good conscience on your own. I could not ever obtain a good conscience on my own. You can't remove your own guilt. No religious acts can do this. No moral conformity. It's not a matter of going to church enough. You can't have your guilt removed simply because your parents are believers. We could never do it our own. On our own. There's not a secret word we could say or a special prayer we could pray. The only way our guilt can be removed is if God acts, if God saves us, if God grants faith, and in this we receive his protection through the resurrected Christ as an ark of safety from the judgment we deserve. So, believer, there is such, such a stabilizing comfort knowing that when evil comes against you, and, and, and listen, if you live in this world as a believer, evil will come against you. We are surrounded by wickedness, and yet you are protected from the evil schemes against God's people. Later in the book, Peter's going to talk about Satan Roaming around like a prowling lion, seeking whom he can devour. There should be a, a sober, sober preparedness for attacks against God's people. And there should be an unwavering confidence in the sufficiency of the work of Christ to sustain us in it. We just don't have to fear those things. Should we be on guard? Absolutely. Should we actively and intentionally pursue holiness? Yes, out of love for Jesus. Do we need to live in perpetual fear that Satan might somehow undo what God has done? Never. Never. There's a stabilizing comfort for us knowing that when evil comes against you, you are under, you are shielded by God. You are under his care and his protection protection. And not only that, you are shielded from God's judgment on the wickedness as you're covered by your ark of safety, Jesus, being immersed into Christ. And he'll preserve your soul no matter what harm comes against you in this world. Listen, the worst the world can do is hurt this temporary fleshly body. They can't touch your soul. God will bring you through the judgment covered in Christ's righteousness with your guilt removed, bringing you into the fullness of your resurrected eternal life in him. That's the worst the world can do is bring you into the best of what God has brought to you. Think about that. And even when evil comes against you, God upholds you in your faith and those trials and those persecution. God has persecutions. God has divine purposes in those things and he uses those things to prove your faith, to strengthen your trust, to increase your holiness. The hostility of the world is then turned against the perpetrators as what they intend to be your undoing is actually a means of God's strengthening grace in his people's life to mature you and bring you safely through to the end. 
This truth has such a profound, profound impact on how we view suffering in this life, does it not? Oftentimes, we seek to do whatever we can to avoid hostility from the world. And listen, we shouldn't try to invite it just for hostility's sake. It's not like we try to go about and just provoke the world unnecessarily against us. But if we're faithful to Christ, it will invite hostility against us because they hated Jesus and crucified him. And if we're followers of Christ, the world will hate us as well. As we walk in godliness, we're an indictment on the world. And yet the reality is, if you are in Christ and obedient, you can't avoid this hostility, and yet we don't have to fear the world and the culture's hostility against us because we know we will be brought safely through. This is why Peter says what he does in verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same purpose. When you truly understand and embrace these truths, when you do suffer for Christ, you'll be stabilized in your faith in the midst of them. You won't question God's character. You won't run to sin or shrink back in the midst of your affliction. You you will stand firm because you know God will bring me safely through this. Jesus is my ark of safety, and so you trust God, knowing his faithfulness, knowing Jesus is Lord over the believer. He is over you. He is your ark of safety from judgment, and Jesus will safe, bring you safely through not only the hostility of this world, but the impending judgment that awaits the world. Listen, that that should just invigorate us to go proclaim the gospel from the hilltops, should it not? And yet there's more encouragement for us even yet. Lastly, Jesus is also Lord over all authorities. Verse 22, who, that is Jesus, is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. For Jesus to be at the right hand of God means Jesus has the ultimate place of authority. He is over angels and authorities and powers. Every being in the heavenlies, every fallen creature is under Christ's ultimate rule and reign. We talked about last week how oftentimes we see this picture of good and evil as if they're equal. And it's this tug of war going back and forth. And there's a curiosity, who's going to win in the end? As if it's some sort of equal battle. And that's just never what we see on the pages of Scripture. God is always ruling and reigning. Jesus has currently, right now, at this very moment, the ultimate place of authority at the right hand of the Father. Everything is under his rule. Everything has been subjected to him. And so this ark of safety for us, who intercedes for us, who's clothed us with his own righteousness, who is the source of security and safety for us, he is also our salvation. He has conquered death. He's ascended on high. He's at the supreme place of authority over all. And Paul in Romans 8 says, nothing can separate you from this one's love. Nothing. So Peter is giving here such emboldening truths for the believer. We don't need to turn there, but do you remember Stephen in Acts 7? Stephen, as he's about to be stoned, the first martyr He gazed intently into heaven. Do you know what he saw? The first martyr, about to be stoned to death, he gazes into the heavens. Do you know what he saw? He saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. As he was being stoned, then he cries out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. 
we need that kind of faith. We need that heart. We need that confidence in the goodness of God in the midst of our affliction. He cried that out. And then do you know what happened as Jesus was standing at the right hand of the Father and this faithful Christian was about to be stoned unto his death? Jesus did not descend and pull him out of his affliction. It actually says that Stephen died. He died. Stephen is being stoned. Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father on his throne, reigning over all authorities. And you know what? Stephen was brought safely through in the ark of protection that is Christ. It is now with his Savior. Safely. Jesus was no less faithful. Sometimes we want to put put expectations on what our deliverance must be, that our deliverance must be removal from temporary trials and challenges and hardships and pains and maybe even death. And that's not what we're promised. We are promised something so much more infinitely better. We have been brought to God. We are baptized through the resurrection of Christ, that is, we are immersed into Christ through his resurrection, and he is our hedge of protection. He will see us safely through. We no longer stand with a guilty conscience before God. Our guilt has been removed. Peter's giving these wonderful truths for when we suffer for Christ, but listen, these realities, these are true at all times. Whenever you're tempted to doubt, when you are weak and struggling when you're in your faith, when you're fighting for joy, when you're fighting for contentment and godliness in the midst of trials in your life, if you are in Christ, your greatest need has been addressed as your guilt has been removed and your sins have been paid for. And it could only come through Jesus. Jesus died for sins. Jesus conquered death. He's Lord over demonic schemes. The opposition now has no reign over your life. It is God who reigns over you. It is the omnipotent king who rules over all authorities, Jesus Christ, and he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Nothing can separate you from his love. As you are constantly and eternally loved by him and secured in him. Amazing. Amazing. And Peter follows this up with what we'll see next time when we're in 1 Peter. Tyler's going to take the next few weeks uh, preaching in Isaiah. I think it's Isaiah. Um, He's going to take the next few weeks and then we'll be back in chapter 4. But look back at, I referenced it earlier, what Peter says at the beginning of chapter 4. In light of all of this, therefore expect an easy, comfortable life. No. No. It's not what he says. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Are you ready to suffer in the flesh for Christ? If you are in Christ, you need to be. And one of the most helpful ways to be ready is to ground yourself on these stabilizing truths about the greatness of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity of your word. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you, God, for what you have accomplished in your son, Jesus. We thank you for the hope that we have in him. We were utterly hopeless without God in this world. And yet you interceded, you stepped in, you were faithful to your promise all the way back from Genesis 3. You are patient, and you are gracious, and we praise you and we thank you. We pray these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's-